Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and welcome to Washington State University Tri-Cities first event of 2023 for the Community Classroom Series. The Community Classroom event began in 2020 and are presented in partnership by the Offices of Student and Academic Affairs, WSU Tri-Cities Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, and the WSU Tri-Cities Mosaic Center for Student Inclusion. This evening, we'll be discussing climate change and future plans for clean energy in our region. My name is Jillian Cadwell. I'm a research associate at WSU Tri-Cities and team lead for the Department of Energy Inclusive Energy Innovation Prize. I am pleased to welcome here this evening our esteemed speakers. We have Dr. Sandra Haynes, Chancellor Haynes here. She is the seventh chancellor of Washington State University Tri-Cities and brings more than 20 years of successful high-level administrative experience stemming from leadership at both a doctoral granting university with very high research activities, we also call an R1 institution, and a regional comprehensive institution offering bachelor's and master's degrees. Dr. Haynes holds a faculty appointment as professor in the Department of Psychology as a first generation student, she recognizes the transformative power of higher education and its ability to be a true equalizer for individuals, regardless of life circumstances. Dr. Haynes maintains a clear focus on excellence in academics, exceptional student support, and service to the community and industry, which in turn enhances diversity, equity, and inclusion. She uses innovative data-driven strategies to best fulfill the campus's land-grant mission to serve regional industry needs through excellent education, research, and service. Thank you for being here, Chancellor Haynes. We also have Jason Herbert here. He is the Senior Director of External Strategy at Energy Northwest. He advises Energy Northwest and project partners on external affairs strategies and consults with entities across the country on energy, climate, and environmental policy, all of them. Jason is co-founder of Clean Future Northwest, co-chair of the Mid-Columbia Energy Initiative Nuclear Energy Subcommittee. That's, that'd be a tough acronym. And Nuclear Matters Steering Committee. Prior to joining Energy Northwest, Jason spent a decade working in the US House of Representatives, consulting on energy and environmental policy and advise, advising political campaigns. In Congress, he advised members on numerous policy issues and held several senior staff positions. Thank you for being here, Jason. Thanks for having me. At this time, I'll hand it over to Sadae Lopez, Program Assistant for the Inclusive Energy Innovation Prize and a student here at WSU Tri-Cities. But first I'm gonna introduce her. Here we go. Sadae uh, is a junior majoring in business administration and pre-pharmacy. So one wasn't enough, we're going double. Um, she is our network assistant lead for WSU Tri-Cities Clean Energy Ambassadors Network, which we uh, have the acronym of KEEN. And she oversees th 13 teams researching a spectrum of clean energy and climate related topics, addressing Justice 40 goals and directly engaging with underserved communities. I see some of our uh, keen student ambassadors are joining us this evening, and thank you for being here and on Zoom. Uh, and I'll hand it over to you, Sadi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alrighty, so we're gathered here together this evening to learn about the plans for WSU Tri Cities Institute for Northwest Energy Futures (INEF) and the future of nuclear and renewable energy generation in our region and in our state, specifically small modular reactor development. I'd like to start with you, Chancellor Haynes. How do you envision the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures will impact our community? Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I'm gonna run over here and get to my slides. We actually prepared slides for this. It's not a full on panel discussion. Um, so anyway, I've been asked to talk about the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures, and I'm really grateful uh, to Jillian and to you uh, for inviting me here to be able to talk more about what, what we're actually going to be doing and what, what we're doing now and what we're actually going to be doing with the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures. So thank you. I'm gonna start though, not talking about 
the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures per se, but start with sort of an overview of the nation's and the state's energy status and goals, because that is the actual reason why we started the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures. And then I think it will give me a direct pipeline into talking about the Institute itself. So you all know this, this is not something that's new to anybody, is that the US is un undergoing a major energy transformation. We have um, some strict climate goals, strict decarbonization goals to meet, um, and really it's a matter of saving the planet, making sure that we decarbonize um, our air and our water and all of our environment, let's just say environment, since we do environmental research here, so that we um, have more generations to come. So what we're trying to do, the goals are really to lower the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to mitigate climate change. And then the other thing that um, has come out in this most recent round of energy policy is to make sure that we're addressing equity issues in energy policy and production. And as we talk about that, I'll talk about it more later, but as we talk about that, that's not something that we've really done, had a lot of focus on as a society before. And it's, it's prominent in both President Biden's goals and also in Governor in, Inslee's goals. Inslee's goal, that's a hard one. Inslee's goals to make sure that we're addressing equity issues when we talk about the energy transition um, and our environment. And it's very important, and I'm actually delighted that we're finally looking at those things. Right now, in these with these goals, we've had a heavy focus on transportation and in building, but clearly we're going to be uh, looking at other things as we move forward. For us, I think one of the major things that we'll need to focus on is on agriculture and how do we transform agriculture uh, to make it a, a clean energy using sector. All right, next. So if you look at what we're doing um, or what we've done and why perhaps, um, well, let me get into that. So if you're looking at what, of what we've done, I'm gonna go kind of backwards on this slide or I'm gonna go from the right to the left. Some people, I guess that's not backwards. I should be uh, sensitive to that. But if I start on the right here, um, we have had clean energy for quite some time, especially in the state of Washington around hydropower. That's what we would call a legacy contributor to clean energy. It's not without consequences. Uh, controversy, but it definitely is a major provider of clean energy for the state and actually for the nation too. Then when we, when, when the state of Washington and when the nation and the world started going into, we need more clean energy, we really focused on wind and solar. We had nuclear, it had, a, it had a few little issues with it and people got a little nervous about nuclear for a while. Um, and we focused a lot on wind and solar. Um, and we, that, those are pretty commercialized now. You can go out and you, well, you probably can't get a windmill in your backyard, not that you would want one, but you can certainly put solar powers, panels on your house. Energy Northwest has a big solar farm or will have a big solar farm, um, uses all of these in commercial applications. And then what we see right now is what we are calling the rising clean energy. And that's where we see biofuels. So fuels that are produced uh, from waste, we have in our bioproduct sciences engineering laboratory, we produce uh, biodiesel and other fuels uh, from the agricultural waste to the feedstock that we would normally throw away, taking those carbons out and making them into um, something that's usable. But it's also things like bio-natural gas. Everyone's heard about the controversies with gas stoves and um, perhaps bio-natural gas. I am not the scientist in the room. You just heard I'm the psychologist in the room, but perhaps 
bio-natural gas might give us a better uh, handle on being able to use our gas stoves again. But, and then we have what's really important, I'm trying to move the screen, but that doesn't move that way, um, is the advanced uh, modular nuclear reactors, which Jason is going to cover in great detail. Um, these hold great promise uh, for the future and for clean energy, and they're going to actually be extremely important in our energy transition for making sure that we have the clean energy we need, but also the reliable energy that we need, because and cost-effective energy that we need. So taking those three things into consideration, that makes that focus on the advanced modular reactors very important to us. Okay, one other thing I'd like to say before I leave this slide, and that is one of the reasons we want the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures here in the Tri-Cities and here in the Mid-Columbia region is that we have access to all of these things. We are really a hub of clean energy, especially clean energy production. We have wind, as you probably heard last night, and we have solar, we have a lot of sunshine, we have hydropower, we have, as I mentioned already, the sources to make biofuels and the technology to make biofuels. We can make hydrogen, um, using things that we have, steam, <laughs> steam and water and all of the things that surround us. Um, we have the technical capability to do it. We have uh, PNNL in our backyard. And of course, Energy Northwest has been a tremendous partner um, in a couple of advanced modular reactor companies. So we have all these things in our backyard. So it made a lot of sense for us to, for at WSU Tri-Cities to focus on clean energy and clean energy production. Uh, but that's not the only reason. So um, one of the things that's missing from this slide is that there are challenges with moving into our clean energy future. And so most of those, if we go back to the slide for a minute, how they're represented is how they're developed. So they're kind of developed in silos. I'm pointing to this screen as if you can see it. I need one or maybe one of those. So we have researchers and we have producers that do biofuels, that do wind, that do hydropower, that do the advanced um, nuclear reactors. But what's missing from that is how do those things work together? How do they complement each other and even how might they compete with each other? And what are the long-term implications of using um, all of these types of uh, energy production? What happens, for example, when so wind scary. took off, is that a weird thing to say? Um, oh, am I supposed to be done? So when wind took off, um, we put up windmills all over and it was a great source of energy. But now what do we do with the windmills once they fall apart? So some of the things we need to do is look at, again, how do these work together to give us that reliable, affordable grid that we need? But also, what is the lifespan of these technologies? And what is the, what is, and if we're looking at lifespan in the technology, also, what is going to be in our transition versus what is going to be long term? So we're going to maybe use some technologies that will get us transitioned into a clean energy future, but they may not be the end all be all. So how do I, we identify what the lifespan of these technologies are and be able to predict that into the future? How do we predict the economic activity? implications of using um, these technologies? How do we predict what the social consequences might be of using all these technologies? And that's where we really get in to the equity piece. So Institute for Northwest Energy Futures is designed to take a systems approach to evaluating how how these systems might work together, how they might compete, and what the long-term effects of using them are. So that's what it really is. It's, we will take 
and we'll use um, all of our scientific resources that we have close to us from PNNL, <clears throat> from across the WSU system, and we'll integrate all that scientific technological knowledge using a systems approach to be able to inform uh, policymakers, industry, energy producers um, on what they should be doing in the future or what the consequences of their action or inaction is. So it's really um, a way to um, take bridge the gap here, as it says, bridge the gap between science and policy. Um, and we'll have our best and brightest minds able to do that. On the bottom here, it also says that we'll consider the social impacts of policy cho choices. So I don't want to I don't want to skip over that. There are a lot of social impacts that we again we haven't thought about before that we need to think about now um, as we're moving forward. Some of those are that in the mid Columbia region right now, 80% of our of our energy in the state is produced right here and 80% of the usage is across the Cascades. So we get to see all the windmills. We get the pollution from the windmills, and I know that's a controversy, but we get the flashing lights and we get the noise. Um, we uh, get to see the solar fields. We have all these things in our backyard, but we don't see necessarily the benefit of it that the people, that it all gets shipped across. So what tends to happen is that we place the energy production, and this is historical, you can see it with coal, you can see it with gas, you can see it all along, but we place the energy production in the areas where the people have the least voice in where the energy gets placed or where that production gets placed. And this can have um, consequences to people's health and well-being, and we need to take that in con into consideration. So the people who are using it are not necessarily getting the ill effects, they're getting all of the benefits, but not the ill effects. One of the ways that we're looking at it, um, at, at the social impacts at WSU Tri-Cities, is making sure that the people who are here, the people who come to WSU Tri-Cities, and we have a very diverse population. We're half women, we're half first-generation college students, and half people of color. How do we make sure that those people end up getting the good jobs, the good paying jobs in the end? Because sometimes that doesn't happen either because of the way we, we tend to um, educate um, our citizens. So that's something that we're looking at, especially through um, uh, the DOE Innovation Prize, making sure that we have distinct pipelines for the people who might be impacted. All right, so I mentioned the Mid-Columbia region. We have a lot of great stuff here. We have the energy infrastructure. We have WSU PNNL Bioproducts Institute, and we have the Tri-Cities Bioproduct Sciences Engineering Laboratory. I already mentioned those. We have the research in place. We can do this. One thing before I stop, because I would be remiss if I did not mention that the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures was started with a generous gift from Bob Ferguson, who was an energy mogul in his own right, had lots of stories to tell me at one point about uh, Energy Northwest and starting up Energy Northwest, as well as the B Reactor, um, a really great advocate for energy and clean energy in the Tri-Cities, uh, unfortunately passed away this last year, but we were really grateful for his gift to get us started. Um, I think I'll skip this because it's really part of the questioning and I'll just turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Chancellor Haynes, and thank you for having me here. I'll wait till my slides get put up. I'll, I'll stand up here. Well, Chancellor Haynes covered some of the things that I was gonna talk about that we knew that that was going to be a challenge um, or that that was going to to occur. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what we see coming in the in Washington State and the Northwest as far as what the future of energy looks like, uh, the role that nuclear energy technologies, especially advanced reactors and small modular reactors are going to play. And to start it off, I'm going to go through a little bit of kind of how we got here. So 
I always like to say, you know, electrons don't stop at state borders. So when states pass climate policies and clean energy policies, for instance, in the Northwest, we're within a, a regional transmission uh, organization, the largest one, which is uh, Bonneville Power Administration. But in the core Northwest region of Washington, Idaho, Oregon, parts of Montana, uh, there are 39 different balancing authorities, which essentially means there are 39 different transmission systems, all that are trading power back and forth every 15 minutes throughout the day. And I think the key thing that um, really struck me, even though I spent almost a decade doing energy policy on Capitol Hill, it wasn't until I came out here and started working for a utility that I really learned how electricity systems work is, you know, electricity is generated, transmitted, and consumed simultaneously. And I think that's what really is important as we move forward. And you look at things like capacity factors, how often is a resource actually generating electricity and how do utilities and states and and regulators and others plan to make sure that you have a reliable grid so that when everyone comes home and is charging an electric vehicle at night, running their dishwashers and their all of their appliances, you know, between six and 10 o'clock, you'll see peak uh, our load or demand skyrocket at that time. So this is just kind of a list of the uh, key policies that have happened uh, on the West Coast in the last couple of years. The big one would be the Washington uh, Clean Energy Transformation Act that was passed in 2019. Uh, this has kind of three phases to it, uh, no coal in 2025, carbon free or uh, greenhouse gas neutral in 2030, and then ultimately 100% carbon free by 2045. And the nice thing about the uh, CETA, as we call it, the Clean Energy Transformation Act, is that it really is technology neutral. It allows utilities to choose the clean energy technology that works best for them. And, and one of the key components of it, too, is that it included nuclear energy uh, as one of those technologies uh, that is recognized as clean. Uh, Oregon, two years later in um, 2021, which helps me always remember the name of the bill because it's House Bill 2021. I don't know if they did that on purpose. They did something similar. Uh, it's actually very similar to Washington's law, although they have to be 100% clean in, in 2040. Uh, why they couldn't have parity with us to make things a little bit easier, uh, again, because electrons don't stop at state borders. Uh, and then California has a whole host of um, different ones. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but let's just say there's a lot of clean energy regulations uh, in California and they're moving aggressively in that direction. So, you know, we're really blessed, um, as Sandra said, in Washington state, you know, we are want first or second year over year for the cleanest uh, energy producing state in the country. That's largely due to our abundant hydro with the federal Columbia River power system. As you can see, that accounts for about 64% of our net generation year over year. Uh, we also get about 9% from our one nuclear plant, which is Columbia Generating Station, 1,207 megawatt uh, nuclear power plant that Energy Northwest owns and operates, uh, which is 15 miles, 10 miles north of where we are now. Uh, and then we see that wind comes in at about 7%. Solar, I've been asked, like, why isn't solar in here? Solar is actually like 0.04%, so that doesn't come in for a lot. But the real challenge as we move forward and we try to decarbonize uh, the electric system is kind of twofold. One is we have to replace the 7% from coal and this 13% from natural gas. And the key to those is, those are resources that can be turned on when you need them. We call them baseload resources or firm resources. But if you see a big hike, uh, spike in power demand, those are the resources that you can turn to. So as we phase those out, replacing them with resources that are reliant on the weather like wind and solar without a long-term uh, storage solution becomes a major challenge. Um, and the other um, challenge that we see going forward is other parts of the economy are also being decarbonized. So when you start talking about adding millions of electric vehicles to the roads, those all have to be charged. That also puts strain on the transmission system, but it also means that we have to have new sources of clean generation able to power those. And if we talked about natural gas being phased out for, for home heating and for stoves and grills, you know, if that happens, that also increases the load on the system. So all of these things None of these decarbonization policies happen in a silo. And we had a speaker recently talk at an Energy Northwest event in the fall, which my CEO used at an event last week, but he said, you know, energy is life. And, and it really is true, electricity is. And if you look historically in the 20 and 21st centuries, um, the greatest indicator of economic prosperity is access to reliable and affordable electricity. And that's where we are a world leader and we want to maintain that um, leadership role as we move forward and, and decarbonize going forward. So after the Clean Energy Transformation Act was passed, we commissioned a study to say, okay, how do we get to 100% clean electricity by 2045? So to take a 100 and, 
83 page study and put it down to one slide because that's the time I had. They really looked at four scenarios and this is all new generation that would be added essentially post 2020 between now and 2045. So assuming that we keep everything that was on that previous slide, all of our wind, the little solar that we have, all of the nuclear and all of the hydropower, if you just did it with renewables, wind and solar and storage alone, as well as some other renewables like combined heat power and, and geothermal and, and biogas and others, but those really didn't come in as the major ones, you would have to build about 115 gigawatts of new generation in the next 25 years. That's doubling what we just have now. Um, and that doesn't even address replacing anything that we're losing. So uh, our nuclear power plant, our license is up in 2043. So we said, okay, if we um, extend that license another 20 years and operate it through 2063, that reduces essentially the overbuild that we would have to do in wind and solar by about 10 gigawatts just from that 1.2 gigawatt plant. Uh, the third column really isn't important that used some NREL numbers. The fourth one is really the key one. And it said, okay, if you start factoring in small modular reactors with essentially a little bit of small modular reactors, you keep Columbia generating station around, add five gigawatts of small modular reactors, you reduce the amount of wind you have to overbuild by almost 50 megawatts, the amount of solar by almost 40 megawatts, and the amount of storage by almost 10. Now, if you're a big fan of wind and solar, under these scenarios, you still build about 30 gigawatts over the next 25 years of wind, solar, and storage. And I think as Sandra was saying, and I think this is what the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures or INEF, because I'm, I can't say the full name over and over again, um, is going to be so important of is we really need to get to a system where we have resources that are complementing one another, not competing with one another. And we also need to have institutions like INEF that can help utilities and others, because as I mentioned, 39 different balancing authorities, essentially transmission networks, over 100 different utilities in Washington state, all focusing on their little piece of the pie or their piece of the puzzle, is very hard to come up with the broad, long-term 20, 30, 50, 60 year plans on what resources you're going to need. And so INEF and the work being done at PNNL and others is really going to be helpful um, as we move that in that direction. So ultimately, to sum up the study, this was the ideal mix. You do wind solar, you keep everything that we have existing, you keep our hydro, and you add in advanced nuclear uh, and SMRs. I'm going to skip over this, uh, but uh, I'll talk about it really quickly. But I think a lot of people don't realize, sorry, um, but nuclear energy is the largest source of clean electricity in the United States. It accounts for 54% of all clean power um, generated in the U.S. and just under 20% of all electricity generated period in the US. And that comes from only 92 reactors at 53 uh, sites around the country. Uh, so a very small footprint, we always talk about how uh, nuclear energy is very energy dense, essentially for one square mile, you get about a gigawatt of energy. I have a slide that's gonna show a comparison to that uh, a little bit later. Uh, but as we move forward, we still think nuclear energy has a big role to play, but the technology is gonna be changing. And this is when we get into advanced small modular reactors. Again, to save time, I kind of changed into one slide instead of two. But what we really see here is that the benefit of small modular reactors as we see them, as we call these generation four technology, is instead of building these massive kind of one gigawatt nuclear power plants, um, you can build much smaller um, individual modules that will ultimately add up to 400, 500 megawatts, but each module is 60, 70, 80 megawatts in size. And this gives you the ability to scale up as you need to. So you could start by building four, run it off of common infrastructure. And then if you have a major uh, battery manufacturer or hydrogen company that comes to the Tri-Cities uh, and says, we need 200 megawatts of power around the clock, you add two additional modules to it and move forward. And there are other really key things too. It's a much smaller geographic footprint that you're going to have uh, with these. Um, all of the systems are passive safety systems. So kind of with the existing fleet, everything is done by operators and there's redundant safety systems. Uh, all of these will essentially be, if you don't touch it, they will safely shut down. Uh, a lot of the fuel using high SA, low enriched uranium uh, fuel, which is even more energy dense than the current fuel we use. Um, Allow, essentially creates the safety case for a lot of these technologies because the plant just can't get hot enough to melt that fuel. So you can't have a meltdown event. And then the other really key thing is online refueling. So for Columbia Generating Station, we take it offline for about 45 to 60 days every two years to refuel the plant. We time that up with the Bonneville Power Administration to make sure that there's enough hydropower and wind and other things on the system. With this, you won't have to do that. So it gives you a lot more flexibility 
And then the really key thing is, is these can ramp up and down very quickly. Hydropower is great at this because if a bunch of wind and solar come on the system, remember this is supply and demand always has to be balanced. I guess I shouldn't do that with the microphone hand. Um, so hydro is great. And that's why the hydro system is so wonderful for us keeping balance on the grid. If, if we have a huge windy day, they'll essentially stop the water flowing through. You're still saving your energy behind the dam. And then once the wind dies down or the sun goes down, you ramp it up again. The traditional nuclear plants, someone described it once and I thought it was a very um, good description is they're kind of 18 wheelers. They were designed for long haul, long distance trucking, but not to be making like sharp turns and doing things quickly. What we're seeing with SMRs is these are kind of like an F1, but they can also drive really long distances too. You can run them as a baseload resource or you can really do it more like hydro and use them as a load following option. So when we're talking about kind of an integrated energy system, they're a perfect pair for the renewables that we have on the grid moving forward. So this is the land use comparison that I was talking about. So this is how energy dense uh, nuclear energy is. To give it in terms without getting into capacity factors, essentially it's for one gigawatt of nuclear, you need one square mile. That's about 640 acres. For an SMR, you need 0 0.04 square miles because you only need 40 acres versus 640. Uh, if you were to do the same amount of wind, one gigawatt of wind would require um, 300 to 400 acres and solar is about 75 to 100 acres. Again, once you start factoring the capacity factors that they're not on all the time, uh, it gets a lot larger. And so this shows if you were to power 6 million homes, which when we created this slide was about what we were powering in Washington state at the time, um, you can see this little blue bubble on the, the right side of the screen, right side of the screen, it is hard. <laughs> Um, it's like the mirror trick, um, shows the footprint of nuclear. And so this energy density, as we were talking about, we're going to be building a lot of new resources. Uh, we are going to need things like wind and solar, but having the ability to have very, uh, energy dense, efficient resources like small modular reactors placed in strategic areas near existing transmission infrastructure will be really key, uh, to where we move in the future. So there are two projects currently planned in Washington state. We're looking at one on site one, um, which is just north of the Tri-Cities near our existing nuclear power plant. It has uh, infrastructure from our previous project on it. It has water intake, uh, and we think this is an ideal site uh, near a substation um, for us to build essentially an X-Energy reactor. And then one of our member utilities, uh, Grant Public Utility District, um, they're uh, a huge data center area now. They have a lot of manufacturing coming in. Um, they're seeing increased demand for clean electricity. And uh, they're also looking at building one in Grant County, about 100 miles north of here. And so the technology we're looking at is, is really, it's, a, it's called a high temperature gas reactor or a pebble bed reactor. Uh, I won't get into all the details. I know I'm gone way over my time. Uh, but essentially, there's a couple things to point out. Again, it's that modular concept. It's scalable. Uh, the kind of the base unit would be 480 megawatt modules, so you get 320 megawatts out of this plant. Uh, continuous fueling, uh, you could scale up with just your common infrastructure to 12 modules. My math's correct, so it would be 960, oh, it's on here, 960 megawatts, so my math is correct. Uh, and the other key thing that we really like about this technology is as we look at increasing drought conditions in the West, uh, this is a helium-cooled reactor rather than water-cooled reactor. So it uses about a what the number is, but let's just say a very small percentage of the water that you would traditionally use in a nuclear power plant using helium as the coolant, and the fact that you don't have to have as much water for backup safety systems as well. So we think this is a really ideal fit for us. Uh, and the other key point here is uh, the high temperature steam that this can uh, produce to help us decarbonize industrial applications, as this can produce steam at 565 degrees centigrade, which I'm told is what you need for a lot of the industrial applications like the vitrification plant and other things. And that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, the concept of climate justice involves the ways in which climate change can have differing social, economic, public health, and other impacts on underprivileged populations and communities. Goals of climate justice include a just division, fair sharing, and equitable distribution of impact, and the need to ensure that our responses don't repeat and reinforce existing systemic, systemic injustice. The following are questions for the both of you. Can each of you please provide us with your perspective on climate justice at a local level? So 
So I talked a little bit about um, the DOE Innovation Prize um, that we've been working on, and part of part of the local um, part of what we see as uh, jo social justice and equity issues is around making sure that. Uh, the people who are greatly impacted by energy production in this area, as we talked about earlier, um, see the benefits. And part of those benefits are the high paying jobs of the of the clean energy future. So making that's that's a huge piece of it for us. But it's also making sure that um, when we're educating our students, that, that we educate them to have a voice for themselves. Um, to take part in their in civic in their civic duties, to participate in their communities, um, to speak to their legislature legislators, um, et cetera, to make sure that their voice gets heard. So, uh, making sure that there's a good civic education as well. I think that's a big piece of, um, especially the local area, as you said, uh, as the social justice for the local area. So I'll take it kind of from a utility perspective with Energy Northwest, we're a not-for-profit um, wholesale power uh, producer, and we have 28 member public utility districts and municipalities like City of Richland, Benton, PUD. Um, I think what, what we see going forward is, you know, with climate justice at the local level is that everyone has kind of equal access to, to clean air, clean water, and clean energy, but really the key is that it's affordable. Um, there was a, my old CEO used to always say like the, tr if the transition to, to clean energy and addressing climate change is not going to be cheap. Um, but the key is to make sure that there's an equitable and kind of just distribution um, of how we make that transition and that everyone has the opportunity to participate in it. And as, as Sandra said, you know, there are a lot of really good high paying jobs, especially in the nuclear industry. Um, and we're going to see that with small modular and advanced reactors too. And so I think that's going to be really key is making sure that, um, we are reaching out to those communities that they have a say not only um, in the process on where we site these projects and how they get built um, and where the supply chain gets built, but though they also have the opportunities to come in and, and go to WSU Tri-Cities. And we've talked about trying to get a simulator out here to do uh, training so that people can come in and essentially, we're hoping it'll only be a six month course to essentially learn how to become an, a reactor operator uh, on an advanced or a small modular reactor uh, and then go work at different plants around the country uh, with a six-figure job uh, pretty much immediately. Uh, so for, for me, I think um, what it comes down to is just the really making sure that we're doing this in a way that's maintaining a reliable electric grid, one that's affordable, and that people can really take advantage of all of the benefits that are going to be provided, like the incentives for electric vehicles, for solar panels, all of those things, which for underserved communities you know, hasn't always been the case. It's very hard to get a rebate on a solar panel if you don't own your own home, right? Or if you live in a, an apartment building, it's not as easy to own a, an electric vehicle than maybe if you, again, like own your own home and can put an electric vehicle charging station in your garage. And so I think those are the things that we need to work uh, as utilities with the community to solve those problems moving forward and hopefully with Institute for Northwest Energy Futures. I, I think you're you're right about the affordability because as we look to the future and we we know that we're not going to sell uh, combustion engine cars in the state in the next 10 years, um, there will be people who already have and will be able to have access to um, electric vehicles more easily because of their income bracket and there will be people who do not. Um, the, the Biden administration's um, very generous uh, bills for um, making sure that we get the clean energy future that we need um, has been called the new deal of our time. And I think about that. I think about, well, when the new deal first came out, it was a chicken in every pot, right? Now it's an electric vehicle in every garage, but how do we make that happen for people? How do we, you know, how do we promise people who may not be able to afford those things that they will have access to it? So I think that that's very important. Please. And if I can add on to that too, I think, and that's also how do we make sure that we have the infrastructure um, to support all those electric vehicles and that electric vehicle charging, as I said, all those that are added is going to increase demand, but it also puts uh, challenges on transformers on how the electricity actually gets delivered into your home. Um, I won't get into all the technical specifics of it, but if you were to put 
electric vehicle charging stations and especially fast charging stations in every garage and every house, you'd start blowing transformers. So we have to start upgrading. We have to look, take a system wide approach to this. And I think that's, you know, the Justice 40 initiative that's come out of the Biden administration and the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, too, to some extent. Uh, we've seen a lot of these really good policies come out that are saying, like, at the front end, as we make this transition, these need to be the priorities as the transition is made, that it needs to be just and equitable. Uh, it's already going to be a challenge to transition to clean energy, but we need to know what, you know, the top priorities are going in. I think, I think that's been refreshing to see. Thank you for that. And now our next question is, please tell us about opportunities that you know of for a stronger unity between regional communities with regard to upcoming climate and energy related opportunities. So the question was on the opportunities. So I think there's almost too many opportunities at this point. I mean, uh, we were talking about this last week, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law provides essentially 62 billion dollars to go towards this clean energy transition, 40%, which are supposed to go to essentially DCA's disadvantaged communities. And um, if you look at the number of grants and funding opportunity announcements and other things that are coming out of not just the Department of Energy, but federal agencies across the government from the US Department of Agriculture to Bureau of Reclamation and, and on down the line, it can be overwhelming. And knowing what you qualify and what you don't qualify for, and it's not a necessarily an, an easy process to apply for those things. Uh, that one, it's very time consuming, it can be costly, and then there's no guarantee that you're actually going to you know, receive the, the grant or the award for those projects. And so, yeah, I think Energy Northwest, we've started setting up a, a team to work on grant proposals. I know that's something that WSU has been talking about. I know PNNL is looking at it. So I think as a community, we really need to work together and, I, and not try to go for everything, but go for the, the key opportunities that really fit well with the history that we have for innovation in the Tri-Cities um, and what we can build on that we already have here as far as like our existing capabilities and our existing expertise um, and really focus in on those, but work together as a community because that's really a key component of a lot of these applications is showing community support. How is this going to benefit the community? How is it gonna serve the, the disadvantaged communities? Um, and really start doing outreach and making sure that they know what grants are available. And I think it's going to become a little bit clearer in the next year. It's been, you know, all of these bills have been passed so fast in the last year and a half. It's been remarkable. And I, I think some of the agencies are just a little bit overwhelmed trying to get these all out and process them. Uh, and so the, it's been a bit of a messy process. And, uh, but going forward, I think it's going to clear up a little bit. And we have some great senators and representatives in their offices can help with those processes, too. Yeah, I think that that's, that's excellent. And then it sort of makes my head spin some days, how many, how, all the opportunities that are coming out. And I look at Jillian Cadwell, who, who jumped on one of the very first grants that came out from DOE, the Innovation Prize, which was a new grant. And I, uh, you know, I think what we have to be looking for are those kinds of unique opportunities, as well as what we also think about when we think about energy innovation. Um, and because there's going to be, there is plenty out there and it's gonna be hard for institutions to be able to go for them all. And I think we do have to be strategic. And I think it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. I really do. We can't, it's gonna be hard for one institution to go after it all. I think we move forward better if we move better, if we move forward as a community and we move forward together as a group when we're looking at these um, opportunities. I would also say that, um, it, if it makes our heads spin for, and we're involved in large institutions, individuals also, it'll be difficult, I think, for people to catch up to all the thing, opportunities that they might have. Can, is, is, are there rebates for solar panels? Are there ways to get electric vehicles more inexpensively, et cetera, et cetera? Those are all gonna be out there and it's just gonna take a lot of, a lot of vigilance to make sure that you get to take advantage of those uh, when they come around. And on that point, too, of there being a lot out there, there's also a lot of opportunities at the state level, too, through the Clean Energy Fund. And we're seeing more of those uh, come out, uh, too. And there's going to be an increase in the Clean Energy Fund, which has been a really beneficial um, source of um, funding for some of the key projects that we've been doing in the Tri-Cities around electric vehicles, around our solar and storage facility. Um, but if you add in the state level opportunities, too, then it just gets even more complicated. 
Alrighty, thank you. For the first time in our nation's history, the U.S. federal government has made it a goal that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by population. How can educational organizations, our local businesses, and community partners promote climate justice? We've already spoken to some of those today, um, but I... Um, Besides the overburdened with population, we fit all of those things. And I, I would say that um, um, one of the things I would take issue with in that description is that really rural populations are can be as affected and impacted as uh, large, heavily populated urban um, uh, areas as well. So I think... Um, so my heart goes to the rural areas because we're fairly rural out here. Um, but the, the, the under, as we said earlier, you know, we tend to place our production facilities um, far away from where it's actually used. And that creates any kind of issue. And so I think um, when we're looking at moving forward, we have to think, we have to think about, are we unfairly burdening um, underrepresented populations at the expense of um, population centers that are more affluent, um, more white, um, those kinds of things, because they don't want it in their backyard, right? So we don't want to necessarily see those things. I don't want to see the transmission lines. I don't want to see the windmills. I don't want to see and have the pollution of the power plant that's... Okay, um, but the power plant that's next to me and the, the coal producing and the gas producing and, and the ill health effects, we have to start thinking about how do we equitably distribute those things. And um, it's not just uh, for it's not just in distributing the production, but it is just making sure that we're not unfairly burdening one population over another. Um, because of the advantages that one population has and and um, another population doesn't have. Um, I'd say locally, too, one of the things that's really exciting to me is the transition to clean energy is, can actually be very helpful to the mid-Columbia region. We're known as a cleanup site, or we're known as sort of the cleanup area because of Hanford and... Um, you can doesn't you don't have to drive too far and they say oh you're from Han you're from that you're from that area you're from the cleanup site it's a terrible place to be and can't believe it and um, kind of this negative connotation with it but that really negates what we really have here what our what our um, natural resources are what our intellectual resources are and so I think that putting us more on the map as the clean energy site helps us to really move forward from clean up to clean energy. I've said that a million times, but I think that that's really important. I think it it is going to be a huge boon to this economy to move away from how we're the negative connotation into the very positive connotation because we, we deserve that positive connotation. We have all the assets here that we need. I'll just say, I think, you or the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures needs to trademark uh, clean up to clean energy before someone else uh, steals it because it is a great catchphrase. Yeah, you know, I think it really just comes down to cooperation. When I look at it on at the local level, how you promote um, climate justice, you know, we have so many great opportunities here, and we we really have such a, a wonderful foundation uh, that has been built. But as we move forward, as we were talking about earlier, you know, we have a lot of opportunities coming for clean manufacturing clean industrial applications, a clean fertilizer company that's introduced interested in coming here. And the challenge becomes is we don't have any surplus electricity to provide them. So we all need to be working together essentially to identify um, where those areas of economic growth are and job creation, really be communicating across all of the communities um, and the different populations on what those opportunities are, what training is going to be required but taking that approach to planning for both, how are we going to, in, going to provide the electricity that's needed? And not only that, but the clean electricity that's needed uh, because it gets into that larger ecosystem of we're not just doing a clean electricity transition. It's a 
a clean energy, a clean environment transition where we're decarbonizing pretty much every sector uh, of the economy in the next 30 years. And that's going to be a major challenge. And I, I think without communication and strong collaboration between all of the entities, and we, and we have a, a great history of doing that in the Tri-Cities and we're very fortunate, but we're gonna have to take it up to another level, I think, to really be successful. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentations and for the questions. Uh, right now we have about a few minutes and hoping to take any questions that may be in the audience or online. So if you can just raise your hand if you have a question, then I'll come to you. Okay. Not actually a question, but there's been a calculation that shows this will cost, like, like to meet CETA, will cost the state of Washington about $200 billion. That's actually not that much over that time span to get that result. And it's almost the same cost as business as usual, almost the same, except there's more upfront capital because you're building things and not putting it up stacks or out of the tailpipe. So, um, so it's kind of interesting. So the, the public has a problem with paying for things up front with the promise it's going to be so much greater later. They, they don't particularly trust that. Um, and that's one of the real, real things. But it won't cost that much more as long as you're phasing out other things and not, you know, putting putting it into fossil fuel. Well, Dr. Jim Conca here. So thank you, Jim. I know you've been busy in Olympia this week because I've been getting emails from all of your great work over there. People telling me about it. And he's been also busy helping our uh, keen ambassadors in the classroom. He's doing everything. Um, I think that's a perfect point too on the challenge that we're seeing with building new nuclear, right? I mean, when you have a $2.5, $3 billion price tag for a plant that's gonna run for 30, 30 or 60 to 80 years, and at a very cost competitive price, even in today's market prices, but the price of electricity is going to go up as you remove natural gas and coal from the system. It's going to be great. We're already seeing greater market volatility in market prices. I mean, at times where it's very cold and very hot, um, a hundred fold increases in, in prices like overnight, it's unbelievable, but it's hard to get people to really make that $2.5 billion investment when you're saying, but then for the next 80 years, you're going to have a reliable, clean source of of power. And that really is, I, I think you, you hit it. That's the challenge that we're going to see, not just with nuclear, but with other sources of uh, energy too. And those investments, as we were talking about on bringing new ma clean manufacturing and other things here is we really have to have that infrastructure set up for them to come here. If they're going to invest hundreds of million dollars in a new you know, clean fertilizer facility, for instance. I also think that, oh, I also think the question is is an excellent question or statement is an excellent statement. And I think that that's exactly what uh, Institute for Northwest Energy Futures is hoping to do is to make sure that that messaging gets out there. So people understand uh, the implications of what we're trying to do here and the ec economics and um, all the whole picture of um, how we're moving forward. So thank you. Hello. Okay, so via Zoom, we have a couple questions. Number one, what setbacks are there in terms of the supply demand of solar panels? And question two, on another note, how could a psychology degree be utilized in changing people's connotations around clean energy? Uh, so on the solar panel, I mean, the supply chain is creating challenges all around. Yes, there are uh, significant challenges in uh, solar panels. We're planning to build a 150 megawatt solar facility uh, just north of here on former Hanford land. We were ideally, I think we wanted to start that about a year ago. Uh, our hope is to get it going this summer. It'll be the largest utility scale solar project uh, in the state of Washington uh, when it's built. I'm sure someone will surpass us, you know, soon after that. But at that time, we'll hold, we'll hold the title for a little while. Um, but that's been a challenge. But uh, if you're trying to, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is building out the transmission system to support all these new resources that we're going to have. Uh, getting key transmission equipment, transformers, substation equipment is also really affected by this supply chain. And then I don't even want to get into steel and concrete prices right now. Uh, but again, that's a, a challenge as well. So I think we're seeing it across not just solar, and it's definitely impacting solar specifically, but really 
almost all energy sources. One, we're seeing higher prices to develop those resources, uh, but two, a shortage of the requisite supplies uh, to build them uh, efficiently. So I think, I think um, clearly from a psychological point of view, it is around messaging. It is making sure that the messages are accurate and, and making sure that they're going to the right people and that people can actually hear what's being said. Sometimes we don't hear what's being said, even though we're perfectly able to, to hear, uh, but the way the message is stated, we just it does it doesn't land. Um, also, it's a it's a mess. It's a being able to um, make sure that people understand what the what clean energy will mean specifically to them. We are tend to be self interested. So, what does it mean to them? And also, how can they contribute? And so there's a really interesting company actually out of Sweden called Climate View, and they do um, research on behavioral change and how to actually do behavioral change at scale. So how do you get a whole city to stop doing their laundry at 6 p.m. Uh, or reduce their, to understand that that's not the best time to do high energy um, tasks because it it just strains the infrastructure how, uh, and things like that. And I think that's definitely a psychological question when you're looking at how do you get people to change the behavior and realize what, what their, how their behavior impacts not only themselves, but the community around them. Do we have time for another question? Yeah. I find it very useful to talk about death. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the questions we have is, how would clean energy change the grid and technical jobs? And they expand by saying, what I mean is people who are trained today by technical schools to work on the grid, is a grid carbon based or just an electric feed to an to any resource? I'll just I'll just start real quick because it goes back to the clean up to clean energy thing. One of the things, one of our true assets in this area is that we have a nuclear trained workforce. So clearly we can those skills are transferable. They'll be transferable into the nuclear economy that we're building here, but they'll also be transferable into the other types of clean energy that we have uh, coming in or that we're developing in the area. That skilled workforce is invaluable. And um, again, those skill, those transferable skills are fantastic and we have them here. Yeah, and I would say as far as the grid infrastructure is concerned, it doesn't really matter what the resource is. It might matter on, you know, whether you have a 500 uh, kilovolt line from a, a resource or a 200 kV line. Um, but really, I think where we see the transition coming is, you know, how do we move those people that are working in fossil fuel uh, industries around uh, generating electricity from coal, natural gas, even, you know, diesel and, and more remote areas and, and oil um, and make sure that they have an opportunity um, to either um, you know, have additional education and training and transition over to kind of the clean energy workforce and work at a nuclear power plant or uh, work for a, a public utility district, um, but making sure that those opportunities are available. And that's been one of the things that's been pretty key in some of the legislation that we've seen at the federal level, like the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, and the CHIPS Act. Now on the, just to quickly sum it up, what the grid of the future looks like could require some additional skill sets that, you know, not really anyone has right now. I mean, if, if we're looking at microgrids and other things that could require a whole other training and I'm hoping the Institute for Northwest Energy Future is gonna take a look at that too. So it would be helpful. Yes, we'll be right on that. <laughs> but actually I think that that's true. And I think one of the things about higher education and is I think higher education or the way we think about higher education is going to need to change a little bit too, because as these things get developed, we're teaching and training young people in one area and that workforce and even the workforce that we have right now is going to need upskilling and reskilling to meet the need and the demand. And so it's going to affect all of our industries, including how we educate. So higher education is um, not exempt 
from the change. Boy, this has been so educational. I really appreciate both of you doing this tonight. I know how busy you both are and uh, it's been just been great to get your perspectives on this. So um, on behalf of our community classroom cohort, we just really appreciate your time and your interest and uh, the video for this session will be posted on our community classroom webpage on WSU Tri Cities um, home site and uh, just have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.